of my presentation is who is Emmy Noether and why have you not uh, why have you never heard of her and a few words about the neoplatonic uh, or neoplatonist uh, philosopher astronomer and mathematician Hypatia and a cameo by a previously unannounced philosopher of conscience who is not an ancient and you'll have to wait to find out who that is this uh, picture on the left is Emmy uh, Noether, and um, uh, this picture on the right is a self-portrait from an art museum, which I was pixelated without uh, painlessly. It was a painless pixelation. And First off, I want to give an attribution for part of my talk. Uh, there is um, a, a term, bhavuna, uh, bhavan, bhavana, bhavana, I think is the pronunciation. It's a Sanskrit word used by ancient Indian algebraists to name a composition of, a principle of composition. And it was introduced by Brahmagupta, uh, who was born in 598 Common Era. And this goes back to the seventh century. Um, this is really quite a nice magazine. It's based in Mumbai, India. And they had a feature article about Emmy Nurther. And India does a lot with. Uh, uh, education uh, in mathematics, I think. They have high quality education in mathematics and uh, uh, more respect and interest in it than the West seems to overall. Um, but this is a story that was featured in um, Bhavavana uh, 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 um, Mathematics Magazine, and I give the link here. And this is also found in the PDF, which I'll share in just a couple of moments um, when a few more people arrive. Uh, this is the story in sketches of Emmy Noether and uh, Constanza uh, Roas Molina uh, was the author. Um, and under the Twitter banner of uh, Northember, um, which employs her uh, Emmy Noether's name, uh, which was initiated by the author. It was an international drawing challenge. Uh, and this was from 2018. And the project resulted in a huge number of drawings, and they selected 30. And um, uh, I'm going to go through all 30. And they're kind of short and sweet, and I think very entertaining. Uh, they're, it's really a delightful article, and this is quite a nice magazine. Uh, if anyone wants to kind of explore it, I would encourage it. So let's begin. Emmy Noether was born at an early age. She was from Erlangen, Germany, and her father was a mathematician, and uh, her mother was Ida Kaufmann. Uh, she was born in 1882. What year, does anyone know what year Einstein was born? Eighteen seventy-nine. So she was pretty contemporary with him. Thank you, uh, Synergy. Synzia. <laughs> yeah, I never can pronounce your name. Uh, at any rate, she went to school and did all the things expected of young ladies. Um, she learned French and English, and also she became a mathematician at uh, a later time, really. She wasn't mathematical to anybody's note uh, as a child. And um, it's often the case, I think, that mathematicians or mathematical people are um, competent in languages. Uh, 
uh, one comes to mind is uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, and when he was in his 60s, he died in his 70s. Uh, he had arteriosclerosis and had a massive heart attack, I think, uh, and died. But uh, in his 60s, he learned Russian because he wanted to be able to read the original articles by Lobachevsky, who was one of the founders of non-Euclidean geometry. Uh, of course, Gauss had discovered non-Euclidean geometry on his own and written it in his journals without publishing it uh, 20 or 30 years before this. But uh, he was trying to mentor it into existence. He knew it was going to be a firestorm to introduce non-Euclidean geometry into the Euclidean world. But anyway, back to Emmy. Uh, she spent her time studying languages. She could have qualified to be a teacher of, Sp of French and English. And uh, she liked music and such. She loved dancing. She learned to uh, cook clean and play the clavier, clavier's piano. Um, she enjoyed uh, family get-togethers and dancing. And uh, was a happy kid, apparently and went to school, showed no signs that she was sharper than the average girl in uh, Erlangen, and um, uh, did fine. But at home, she noted her father's work, and uh, uh, this is um, algebraic geometry is a big discipline that emerged since the 19th century, and it's a it's a really happening part of mathematics, uh, and that's Fritz Noether, her father, who died. Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. Fritz was her brother. Uh, her father, uh, Max, died in 1921. Uh, this is uh, Papa Vasmaxto. What are you doing? Uh, he says algebra and surfaces shots, uh, and uh, Fritz became a mathematician and. Uh, Again, there was no indication that she was going to be a mathematics person at this point. She wanted to go to the university in Erlangen. And now the story gets kind of interesting. She wasn't trained to prepare for the entrance exam, so she spent three years independently studying. And I think there's a lot to be said for independent study. People who study independently tend to generate if they really dig in and take it seriously, they, they tend to generate questions for themselves to explore. They find paths to develop their thinking in their mind. And you're right, uh, it's a, it was uh, rather a, a challenging thing to trying to go to the university, uh, Universität, Universität Erlangen um, uh, at that time. Uh, and she got in, but she was only one of two women in a um, uh, student body of 986 students. She was only allowed to audit classes. She wasn't allowed to fully participate. She was a woman, after all. She had to she had to obtain permission from every individual uh, professor to uh, attend their lectures, and um, uh, this was all to keep things safe, I guess, for somebody. I wonder who it was keeping things safe for. Uh, Herman Weil uh, 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 Weil was um, a prominent 20th century mathematician and. Uh, um, he uh, didn't think of um, Emmy as a rebel, but he pointed out who knew who knows what was in her inner thoughts in the early 1900s. But she did this. She went and uh, did whatever it took because she was following her heart and following her passion. And so uh, she did a thesis eventually, and. Uh, she um, got her PhD, but she thought it was trifle. She wasn't a very uh, uh, 
pleased with her. She was uh, exacting and uh, had high standards in her, uh, what she expected of her work. Um, I, I know violinists like that. <laughs> they sound like they're playing beautifully and uh, uh, they're disgusted at something about the um, intent of what they had hoped to achieve. Well, it's like that in anyone who tries to achieve high things. So she completed her dissertation in 1907, and um, she managed to get some work at the Mathematical Institute of Erlangen, but it was worse than being an adjunct professor. They wouldn't pay her. They wouldn't give her an office. They didn't give her any uh, position. And uh, she worked without pay for seven years. And um, at the time, women were excluded from academic positions. And so at the bottom here, so I missed. You know, that's a, that's a sort of, in German, that's equivalent sort of to saying that's a bunch of scheiße. <laughs> uh, that's a little more blunt. Uh, scheiße is another word for it. Uh, so uh, at any rate, uh, um, now they, these are, when I have day 10, these are day 10 in the contest of the drawings that were submitted. These are not day 10 of Emma Nerther's uh, uh, situation. At any rate, she stuck with it, indomitable little spirit. And uh, 1908, she was, uh, uh, and 1909 started to get breakthroughs where she was accepted into professional societies. And with the um, uh, Deutschen Mathematiker Verein, Vereinigung, uh, or Mathematical German Society, they elected her as a member and she began to give lectures at their meetings. So she grew no uh, drew notice. Uh, she uh, ended up moving at the invitation of David Hilbert and Felix Klein to Gertigen. Gertigen was the center of mathematics in the world. It was the it was where Gauss, Carl Friedrich Gauss, had been, and then Dedekind and um, uh, uh, Hilbert eventually, and uh, Klein was also there. But anyway, they invited her to come and uh, just be a private docent or a person permitted to lecture. And the whole faculty had to agree. That included the philosophers. Of course, they're they're cool, right? Philosophers, they'd be they'd be good. They'd be cool with it. Historians, I don't know. Uh, all of them. They refused. They refused. They uh, as a, it, in this cartoon, it has the statement: "Was I, a Freudlein and our dear faculty nine. Aber nein. Uh, so Hilbert helped her out by having her lecture in his stead. So he would have students who came to hear him talk, and Emmy Nerther would be there. And that says a lot about Hilbert and uh, Klein. You know, I've um, really never met a mathematician I didn't like. Uh, I knew one. Uh, cohort when I was doing mathematics that annoyed me once. We kind of, sometimes mathematicians uh, don't have great social judgment. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, they're really wonderful people. And uh, they don't look down on you for your clothes or uh, don't care about who your father was or uh, if you're rich. Uh, they're interested in your ideas. So who are these guys? These guys, Felix Klein and David Hilbert. Well, Felix Klein was a mathematician, particularly uh, contributed to geometry and um, uh, uh, some things about transcendental numbers. And I happen to have what's called a Klein bottle that was made by a, uh, a physicist who uh, in San Francisco, who 
went into the uh, uh, business of building Klein bottles of all kinds of sizes. And that's a Klein bottle. It's a one-sided surface. It has no inside or outside. And if you cut it longitudinally just right, you get a Mobius strip, which is pretty interesting. Uh, that's my favorite thing about Felix Klein, aside from the fact he looks like a cousin to me. Uh, I was always struck by that. Uh, uh, David Hilbert, uh, he was from Königsberg, which is now um, Kalinstad, I think, uh, Kalingrad. Um, it's now part of the uh, Russian Federation, and it's, they've been trashing it since they took it. Uh, uh, originally, it was Prussian, but has no German um, uh, uh, culture uh, at all left in it. But that was the origin of David Hilbert. Um, a bit older, you see, that, uh, 1849 was when Klein was born, 1862. They were uh, uh, avuncular and helpful and sympathetic to Emmy Nerther because they admired her ability. And she had expertise, particularly in um, uh, um, uh, well, certain aspects of uh, algebra that I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, my favorite story about Hilbert was from the Hilbert Hotel. It has an infinite number of rooms, but they're all occupied. There's and the, the so it's from one to infinity, it's, it's an unending hotel, but there's no vacancy, but we can always move people around. And basically you have each person go in room N, go to N plus one, and that opens up the first room. Or you could start at room, uh, room seven if you wanted and have everybody from uh, room seven uh, move to room eight, the people from room eight move to room nine and so forth. You can always open up a room in an infinite set. Uh, I love that um, um, uh, kind of uh, mathematical um, mind trip. So uh, Hilbert went up against the faculty. He had, uh, I mean, they, he was uh, uh, he was uh, uh, a, a a person they could not do without. Uh, so he had standing to speak against these uh, chauvinists and uh, but she's a woman he says and he's quoted as saying this I do not see that the sex of the candidate is an argument against her admission and um, he was noted for saying after all we are a university and not a bathing establishment so anyway she made her way on uh, discovering various things. And uh, one of the reasons I like this slide, uh, it uh, people would come to her and ask for help with their uh, 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 mathematical problems. And uh, in this, she was saying, oh, I've forgotten all my calculus. Well, she hadn't really. I think that people like her, uh, use their brains um, intensely assimilating, uh, assimilating uh, the entire problem uh, and every aspect of a problem at hand. And they're using all their resources on that problem. And uh, she could go back and uh, uh, pick up where she left off on any other thing, I'm sure. I, I find I'm not a great mathematician. I'm I, like, I love mathematics, but I'm not of the character or of, um, quality of uh, Hilbert or Klein or Emmy Nerther uh, by the longest shot. But uh, I've always been able to figure out pretty much everything I ever learned in mathematics from scratch without looking it up. I just needed a few moments, uh, sometimes a day, um, and it came back to me because it makes sense. You just kind of figure it out. And that's the beauty of mathematics. So medicine, on the other hand, is you have to basically drink all the water from a fire hydrant, 
without spilling any uh, in terms of memory. And it wasn't, it was turbulent, um, unconnected knowledge uh, to a large extent. So uh, she got uh, more and more recognitions as time went on. She was the first woman ever to be a, 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 a top speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians. And then 1933 had the um, extremists uh, managed to vote Adolf Hitler in to be chancellor of Germany. And um, then uh, at some point there was the Reichstagsfire. Uh, that was the government building. It was uh, uh, blamed on gypsies and communists and Jews. And so it was an excuse to start rounding up people. And the parliamentary uh, government of the Weimar Republic was ended and it became the Third Reich. And he got there by a democratic election. He got there by a democratic election. So make sure you vote. Make sure you vote. Anyway, Emmy had to leave. Uh, she would have been executed, murdered in gas chambers at some point if she hadn't gotten out. She was Jewish. And, well, he still got elected. Uh, and, uh, you know, democratically dismantling democracy. Well put. I like your uh, way with alliteration. She wanted to go to Oxford, uh, but they took so long and uh, she left Göttingen and um, ended up going to a university near Philadelphia, which is a lovely university uh, named uh, Bryn Mawr. I've been on that campus before. Uh, it, it's a, um, um, a, a woman's liberal arts college and it was formed in 1885. Um, and I'm sure they were delighted to have her there. It's really, uh, I mean, imagine the honor of having somebody like her. Uh, and um, a lot of other German academics found places to work in the U.S. and uh, actually raised the average IQ of the United States considerably. Uh, and um, the uh, knowledge base as well. Um, so. She did go to Princeton to uh, speak at the advanced uh, 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 Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. I, I met a man who had been there once and talked to him for a time, and he told me interesting stories about people, but she called it a men's university where nothing female is admitted, so she didn't feel welcome there. The Ivy League is uh, fraught with that as much as I try to deny it. Um, uh, anyway, uh, she was a fairly humble person and, uh, you know, was estate uh, alles uh, shown by the dedicant. Dedicant was uh, the man who was uh, head of uh, Göttingen for a time, and he uh, uh, came up with a definition for irrational numbers as based on cuts, uh, cuts that are uh, open cuts in the uh, um, rational numbers in all the fractions. You have holes everywhere. It's not a continuum. Uh, you have a lot of discontinuities, like where the square root of two should be. Well, you can define the square root of two by um, uh, a Dedekind cut. So. In terms of fireworks, I'm going to mention things in mathematics without getting into it too much. So think of it if you're not as familiar with it as seeing uh, uh, lights in the sky from fireworks and get from it what you can. Uh, she was an absolute expert in uh, uh, abstract algebra. Modern abstract algebra is largely descended from 
the ideas and teaching of uh, Emmy Noether, including rings, and which are sets of objects with uh, uh, operations of uh, combination like addition and multiplication. The multiplication uh, can be uh, commutative or not, uh, uh, but uh, uh, in a sense, if it's a commutative ring, uh, think of the energy of the uh, integers, uh, the whole numbers, including zero, one and negative one, two and negative two, and to infinity. And from those, you can uh, cast out modules that are multiples of some number and end up with um, uh, modular arithmetic and uh, which are uh, 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 um, homomorphisms of uh, the integers into a finite ring. It's really quite beautiful. And she, she was tended to see things uh, globally and put these things together. And a few years ago, I think it's the Bernstein Cantor uh, theorem, I proved um, in a June presentation, and I used nested sets, um, uh, infinite nested sets, and you could do interesting things with uh, a, 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 a chain of um, uh, nested sets. They can be strictly nested or otherwise, but uh, she did work in those lines. and. Let's see, let me look back here one more time. Okay, I just, uh, oh, I'm gonna take one second and share my uh, uh, um, uh, note card with everyone here, which has, again, the link to all these slides, and it has a lot of text about it, uh, about this presentation. So if you're enjoying it, um, then uh, uh, you can uh, go back through that. Uh, let's see, I'm having trouble getting it to, okay. <laughs> I think I slowed down my computer. Uh, at least my internet hasn't crashed on me. I had to uh, cancel mathematics uh, club on Thursday because I didn't have internet and uh, uh, went like three nights without it. But at any rate, uh, uh, you can take rings and uh, it can be all kinds of rings. It can be rings of polynomials and do things analogous to what you can do with integers of binding primes or things that are irreducible in terms of being com composed of multiples of other elements. Like six is equal to two times three, but two does have, uh, or three or five or prime numbers have no divisors except for themselves in one. Um, one other interesting point, uh, Amy, uh, um, in her definition of rings did not include one. That's a little bit controversial and a lot of, so depending on what you read it, uh, they should specify if one as uh, a, a, um, a unit uh, is included in the ring. You could do a lot of things if you do that. Uh, it's a it's a little more primitive without uh, one being included in the set of a ring. Anyway, she was expert on symmetries and uh, um, uh, things that were conserved invariants, invariant qual qualities, and her first theorem, but, uh, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Every uh, if you have a continuous symmetries and uh, um, I had a picture I didn't, I decided not to include, I took at an art uh, gallery of a um, kind of a long couch that's a love seat and it had a, a sigmoid back. So it was like a sine wave 
the back, the vertical part, or in the uh, you have the wide seat and going back and forth across the seat was a sine wave that people could sit back against. And that would be an example of something that was uh, had dis discrete symmetries that if you were sitting in one of those little um, concave parts of the sine wave, if you moved uh, an appropriate interval, you could sit in another uh, concave portion of the sine wave. And uh, it would be as though you hadn't changed anything. There would be symmetry there, but that's that's a this is her work dealt really with especially especially with uh, uh, concert, uh, uh, continuous symmetries. And um, I'm going to talk more about this in a moment, but this is really huge. Uh, this uh, Nerther's theorem, and I'll point out my friend who is a physicist, he is a PhD in high energy physics. Uh, I talked to him about it and uh, he was surprised that to learn that Emmy Nerther was a female. He said uh, he never thought about it. He just assumed she was a male and they never gave her first name. But Nerther's theorem is huge in physics. And she did that as a bit of a sideline. So, so a little more about identities. Um, there, if you talk about uh, sets, you can say if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A, you can say they're the same. It depends on the structure of the set and if you should really say that they're equivalent. And she um, was pointing that out there, I guess. Uh, this. Sleeping Emmy Nerther, sleeping on the book of mathematics is a euphemism because this uh, is referring to 1958. The University of Erlangen organized a meeting inviting her former students and their, and their students to commemorate the 50th anniversary of her PhD and discuss her work and applications and influence. She was long dead. Just a couple years after she got to Bryn Mawr, she died. In 1964, the World's Fair devoted modern mathematics, uh, a, a, a section to modern mathematicians, and she was the only woman represented there. And there have been, oh, highways named after her and, uh, 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 Göttingen and Erlangen and other places, and uh, uh, some other cosmic things bearing her name. So she got recognition in the long run to some degree, but most of society doesn't know about her. They make men the heroes. And uh, this pointed out whimsically, I think, that Legos do not. Uh, include an Emmy Nerther Lego. There are other women in science sets from Legos, but not Emmy Nerther yet. So I think maybe we should all write to Lego and tell them we want an Emmy Nerther Lego. I don't know the address. I guess it's probably in Denmark. <laughs> so on her birthday in 2015, there was a Google Doodle to celebrate uh, her and her achievements. So occasionally people still hear about her and her achievements are so deep and pervasive that, uh, um, and deep contributions that uh, she's going to live on. But uh, she had an abdominal tumor and she had an operation in Philadelphia area. I don't know what hospital. There's a lot of hospitals in Philadelphia. And uh, she uh, was discharged. She had a kind of a rough post-op period, went home and died. And she came back to the hospital and died pretty shortly after that. She was only 53, I think. And I tell you what, my suspicion is that uh, they, uh, had some, it wasn't, she didn't die of cancer. She died of a post-operative complication. 
to die that soon after surgery and that suddenly she had not been in bad health uh, uh, ostensibly. And uh, uh, one thing that occurred to me is like the perforation of the bowel, unrecognized. The, the uh, peritoneal cavity can stand to be soiled a little bit. If, if a, a bowel gets a knife wound and uh, it gets fixed, some of the contents of the bowel spills into the peritoneal cavity. Well, you can clean that up and uh, your body can uh, survive that. But if you have continued, continued soilage, then you get peritonitis and sepsis and die. Shock. And it's uh, peritonitis is one of the most painful conditions you can imagine. At any rate, I don't know. I read a lot more into her demise than anybody else wanted to say. But that's me as a physician talking and somebody who's been to years of morbidity, mort mortality conferences where we talk behind closed doors about uh, what went wrong. So once again, uh, I wanted to make an attribution to uh, this magazine, which I think is wonderful. And I think this was a, a really delightful presentation of Emmy Nurther, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'm not finished with my talk. I want to emphasize a major take home message of today is what the hell took us so long to get to the 21st century. Historically, society has made only sparing allowance for freedom of thought and human rights, and especially women's rights. If women had been afforded their fair share of opportunity and appreciation for their contributions to civilization and their abilities, humankind would have advanced much more quickly. We could have been doing what we're doing today in the year 1400. At, um, March 8th was International Women's Day, and it's a, I wanted to address it even though this today is Emmy Nurther's birthday. So happy birthday, Emmy. We're all celebrating it with you. And uh, International Women's Day is a holiday celebrated annually as a focal point in the women's rights movement. Everybody, that's, that's like a hot potato politically, but it has these outrageous expectations like gender equality, reproductive rights, and quelling or uh, opposing violence and abuse against women. So the cartoon I stuck in there just because I thought it was interesting. And it talks about, or alludes to people being outsiders, like the snowman, realizing he wasn't like other precipitation. Okay, the big, big contribution to physics that Emmy Nurther made was on symmetry and conservation laws. Her theorem states that every continuous symmetry of the action of a physical system with conservative forces has a corresponding conservation law. This diagram to the right is, uh, relates to um, uh, um, uh, electrodynamics. But basically, in translation and space, uh, you have symmetry. You have systems can be moved from one spot to another in space and still function without any ostensible difference. And that uh, has the consequence of conservation of linear momentum. And also, uh, conservation of angular momentum arises from these. And um, uh, if you have um, a, a time, uh, a symmetry with respect to time, um, then which you don't necessarily in uh, special relativity, then you have conservation of energy uh, as a consequence. So in mathematics, I'm just going to give a quick statement about uh, I think I'm doing okay for time. Uh, Non-commutative algebras, these are sets with algebraic structures from semi-groups and groups. Groups have just one order, one type of uh, comp way of combining uh, elements 
you can call it addition or multiplication or whatever you want, um, taking uh, 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 composing new elements from um, any two given elements. Sometimes they're not commutative. In other words, A interacting with B does not equal B interacting with A. The order in which they um, they uh, stand uh, makes a difference. Um, but you also have uh, non-commutative uh, algebras, which can be rings and uh, fields as well. Uh, although fields are usually thought of as a commutative, uh, there are uh, division algebras, uh, as they're called, that are uh, non-commutative. Um, and one I can think of that's not even associative. Um, so they approach uh, what are called fields. Fields are like the real numbers or the fractions. And every a field, every element has, except for zero, every element except for zero has an inverse. So that if you take element A and multiply it times its inverse, you get one, you get the unit. So it basically allows for di um, uh, division. Differential invariance, calculus of variations, which is, uh, uh, and, and also Lagrangian uh, uh, mechanics are uh, uh, important to the proof of um, Noether's theorem in physics of symmetries be, being associated with uh, conservation law. And the converse, she also proved that if you have a conservation law in physics, you have a symmetry of some sort. Uh, hyper complex numbers I'm gonna talk about in a minute just for interest. And representation theory is pretty cool. Uh, it's more than we can talk about here, but for instance, if you have uh, a group of elements and you can associate them with uh, 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 matrices that behave algebraically in the same way, you can turn an abstract group of elements into a geometrical um, uh, entity in a sense, because like matrices, square matrices can be considered uh, 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 like from linear algebra, like the group of rotations and that sort of thing. Uh, the idea here is it's combining two different parts of mathematics that seem that they somehow can be bridged and if you can create a bridge and uh, define what that bridge is, anything you can discover in the easier platform, in this case, linear algebra and matrices are a little easier than abstract group theory, uh, will apply to the groups. So she was a pioneer in representation theory. She had the ability to see Connections nobody else seemed to pick up on. Hyper complex numbers, just in a flash. Uh, she published on these 1927 to 1935. And uh, the simplest uh, complex numbers where you have the square root of a negative one. I guess I am giving an equation there. Um, uh, uh, Anyway, it was introduced by a, uh, an Italian gambler, and uh, he actually came up with um, uh, three roots for the cubic equation, x to the cube equals one. Using complex numbers, you can find n roots for one. If you have x to the n is equal to one, you can find n roots uh, using a complex plane and the taking uh, uh, the exponential uh, e to the uh, i theta, uh, i being the imaginary number and theta being the angle. I won't go on about that now, but it's really extraordinary. And I'll just mention William Rowan Hamilton, who was uh, an Irishman, mathematician, probably the greatest uh, Irish mathematician of all time. His uh, 
you had Newtonian mechanics supplanted by Lagrangian mechanics that uh, then went a step further with Hamilton, Hamiltonian mechanics, which uh, if you want to work out energy levels in Schrodinger's equation, you'd use Hamiltonian mechanics. My physicist friend used to talk about Hamiltonian operators and uh, Lagrangian operators all the time. And he came up with quaternions, but quaternions, I guess I should say, quaternions. Uh, that is, uh, some, um, some people refer to them as quadruples. That has four parts. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> you know, the complex numbers have a real part and one imaginary number. Quaternions have a real number and three imaginary numbers that are distinct, uh, usually written as i, j, and k. Um, and they're orthogonal. They're in different dimensions. You could describe four-dimensional space with quaternions. And so, they look like this here uh, the, between the four leaf clovers. And he was walking across the bridge in Dublin and he suddenly realized, I can, I can multiply these suckers. It came to him that there was a way to multiply them and he worked out a full algebra in which he could take these sums of these four, they, they, sort of like a vector uh, of, um, a Q, uh, some real number plus some real number times I plus some real number times J plus some real number times K. Take any two of those and multiply them. And in fact, quaternions, uh, every non-zero element in uh, the uh, 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 of all the possible quaternions has an inverse. It is not commutative though. Whereas complex numbers, you can have a, uh, a times B equals B times A. Uh, that doesn't work for quaternions. And finally, uh, just to let you hear about some of this, uh, hyper complex numbers um, include, um, uh, let's see, did I have, ah, okay. I'm not sure when. Oh, okay. Uh, this is, uh, I just wanted to introduce the Octonians, uh, which a friend, uh, Graves was a friend of Hamilton's, and just a few years after Hamilton had discovered his Quaternions, which was a, a big, uh, a big deal, uh, he realized that you could actually have uh, eight dimensional hyper complex system. And those are called octonians. And um, octonians have one real number and seven imaginary numbers. They, each, it, they, can, they can be used to describe eight dimensional space. And there are people who are using uh, quaternions to try to develop a theory of everything. I don't know where that stands at the moment, but uh, I'm aware of that. Uh, that uh, is the approach that some people that are seriously working on uh, 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 the unified field theory or theory of everything or whatever you want to call it uh, uh, are trying to develop uh, um, uh, physics uh, laws based on quaternions. It's a number. It's a kind of number. And being able to think about numbers more abstractly like M.A. Norther did, opens up universes of possibilities. So, okay, I think I've said most of this. And if you want to go back and look at the uh, PDF uh, about it, that'd be fine. And I, I mentioned about re representation theory. I should have held off till this slide, but I won't go back over it. Um, and basically, representation theory was where you have an abstract algebraic mathematical object, and you can show that it functions the same way something more familiar like a geometrical construct, which can be rep represented by matrices and linear algebra behave. 
and you can make one-to-one -one correspondence between the way those work. And so what you discover for one applies to the other. That whole approach to mathematics is how Fermat's last theorem was proven, if you know about that. Okay, poor Emmy. There is in the note card, um, and if anyone didn't get the note card, I'll share it again at the end, uh, a uh, uh, um, I've got to, let's see. I want to make a quote here. Um, Freilein, this was written after her death. It was a letter to the New York Times by Professor Einstein. Freilein North, Norther was the most significant creative mathematical genius thus far produced. Uh, um, uh, since the higher education of women began. I'm just going to read that line to you. And sound, it's signed Albert Einstein, Princeton University. Nineteen thirty-three, I guess. Nineteen thirty-seven, I think, or thirty-six. I'm not sure, but it was it was in that era. I had to. Part of my slide is obliterated by uh, this particular slide projector. Um, and what happened to her then? Her broken body was taken and cremated. And let's see, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my view of my slide projector back the way I should have it. Uh, I'm sorry for coughing as well. I've run out of medicine for that. Um, my next slide. Her ashes were put in an urn and buried at the cloisters at Bryn Mawr College under an inconspicuous cement slab, bearing only her initials, E-N, the last remains of one of the greatest minds the world has ever known. And so with that, I hope you'll remember her. And I'm so glad I was able to do this on her birthday. Now, I want to talk a bit about, I've got just a few minutes about another, uh, I'm close to the end, um, Hypothea. There was a movie uh, called Agora and uh, with Rachel Weiss. Uh, it was 2009 it came out. And uh, I tried to stream it and couldn't find any place to stream it. So I had to order it from eBay. I wanted to watch it before I gave this talk. Uh, there's a lot written about it, but it's, it's really uh, a worthwhile thing to see if you want to try to understand the turmoil that was occurring in the Roman Empire in the um, early fifth century, uh, leading up to what is it, 476 or 473, I think. Uh, April 473 is that was the fall of Rome. Well, uh, uh, Rachel Weiss uh, portrayed here in this uh, uh, lower uh, right hand picture. Uh, her father was at the University in Alexandria. Alexandria founded by Alexander the Great and Alexandria had the greatest library in all the civilized world. They had over over 5,000 volumes of compendium of human knowledge. And her father was an astronomer and mathematician there and he taught her mathematics and she quickly surpassed him. And Unfortunately, not a lot is known about her, and I'm going to tell you why, but I'm going to do a reading, if you'll indulge me, from Carl Sagan, his book, a companion book with the Cosmos series, which was also entitled Cosmos of 1980. Um, it's on Hypothea. 
uh, and the Great Library at Alexandria. The last scientist who worked in the library was a mathematician, astronomer, physicist, and the head of the Neoplatonic School of Philosophy, and an extraordinary range of accomplishments, accomplishments for any individual in any age. Her name was Hypatia. She was born in Alexandria 370 Common Era. At a time when women had few options and were treated as property, Hypatia moved freely and unselfconsciously through traditional male domains. By all accounts, she was a great beauty. She had many suitors, but rejected all offers of marriage. The Alexandria of Hypatia's time, long since under Roman rule, was a city under grave strain. Slavery had sapped classical civilization of its vitality. The growing Christian church was consolidating its power and attempting to eradicate pagan influence and culture, which is to say any culture that challenged tenets of this new Christian church. Hypatia stood at the epicenter of these mighty social forces. Cyril, the Archbishop of Alexandria despised her because of her close friendship with the Roman governor and because she was a symbol of learning and science, which were largely identified by the early church with paganism. In great personal danger, she continued to teach and publish until in the year 415 Common Era, on her way to work, she was set upon by a fanatical mob of Cyril's parishioners. These were actually Christian monks led by a man named Peter. They dragged her from her chariot and dragged her into a church. She refused to convert. They tore off her clothes and armed with abalone seashells, flayed her flesh from her bones and church. Her remains were burn, uh, burned, her works obliterated, her name forgotten. We know about her because of some historians. Cyril was made a saint. The glory of the Alexandria Library is a dim memory. Its last remnants were destroyed soon after Hypatia's death. It was as if the entire civilization had undergone some self-inflicted brain surgery. And most of its memories, discoveries, ideas, and passions were extinguished ir irrevocably. The loss was incalculable. 500,000 scrolls, books, documents were destroyed. In most cases, we know only the tantalizing titles of the works that were destroyed. We know that of the 123 plays of Sophocles in the library, only seven survived. One of these seven is Oedipus Rex. Similar numbers apply to the works of Aeschylus and Euripides. It is a little as if only the only surviving works of a man named William Shakespeare were Coriolanus and A Winter's Tale. But we had heard that he had written certain other plays, unknown to us, but apparently prized in his time. Works entitled Hamlet, Macbeth, Julius Caesar, King Lear, Romeo and Juliet. Of the physical contents of that glorious library, not one scroll remains, not a single scroll. In modern Alexandria, few people have a keen appreciation, much less detailed knowledge of the Alexandrian library or of the great Egyptian civilization that preceded it for thousands of years. More recent events, other cultural imperatives have taken precedence. The same is true all over the world. We have only the most tenuous contact with our past. 
and yet just a stone's throw from the remains of the Zerapium are many reminders of many civilizations, enigmatic sphinxes from Pharaonic Egypt, a great column erected to the Roman Emperor Diocletian by a provincial flunky for not altogether permitting the citizens of Alexandria to starve to death, a Christian church, many minarets, and the hallmarks of modern industrial civilization. Apartment houses, automobiles, streetcars, urban slums, a microwave relay tower. There are a million threads from the past intertwined to make ropes and cables of the modern world. Our achievements rest on the accomplishments of 40,000 generations of our human predecessors, all but a tiny fraction of whom are nameless and forgotten. Every now and then we stumble on a major civilization, such as the ancient culture of Ebla, which flourished only a few millennia ago and about which we knew nothing. How ignorant we are of our own past. Inscriptions, papyruses, books. These time bind the human species and permit us to hear those few voices and faint cries of our brothers and sisters, our ancestors. And what a joy of recognition when we realize how like us they were. Carl Sagan, 1980. Well, she was revived somewhat by Raphael, who was uh, a Renaissance painter who learned perspective from Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, this is her in a painting uh, of the School of Athens. And this down in the lower center is um, uh, Bishop, Archbishop um, um, uh, Cyrus. Uh, uh, who became a saint. There are, there are authors, of course, that try to protect Cyro and uh, um, his position in history, uh, saying that he had nothing to do with her murder, but uh, you could decide for yourself. Uh, this is the whole painting of the, of the School of Athens. And here, lower left hand corner is Hypatia, who looks quite Italian, uh, Northern Italian, I would say. Uh, they're looking out at the uh, 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 viewer. And there's a self portrait of, uh, of uh, Raphael with uh, uh, Socrates and Plato in the center there somewhere. And I'm getting close to the end. Just wanted to give tribute to Carl Sagan. A nice quote of his was, a universe that is unknowable is no fit place for a thinking being. The ideal universe is, for us is one very much like the universe we inhabit. And I've got one last bit, if you'll indulge me. And this will be very quick. This is taken from uh, a wood cutting. It's not, um, uh, it's not a wood block. It was first originated in 1980, in 1888, rather. Um, I had grandparents alive in 1888. Uh, in 2010, um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson had a second run of Cosmos. And he used uh, this image and attributed this uh, individual looking through the firmament, firmament into the cosmos as uh, Giordano Bruno. And I want to make a couple of lines about Giordano Bruno. He was a philosopher from the uh, 16th century. He was notable for <laughs> extreme nonconformity. And his viewpoint, uh, he went further than Copernicus and his view of uh, the Earth not only being uh, not the center of things, but the sun not being the center of things. He felt there was the universe was likely infinite and there was a multiplicity of worlds like ours. This did not sit well with the um, uh, church and this is really 
uh, it's undeniable that religion, the successful large religions for the most part, became political entities early on and extended their power. They developed power base and behaved to preserve that power base and their authority, just like any political entity does. Um, what happened to Bruno, he had a good instincts and tended to move around a lot and left uh, uh, Italy and went to France and to Germany and published and lots of things. Uh, but he got lured back to Venice to teach, and he thought the things had died down. He had been, he had had to flee earlier on, and uh, he was he taught memory techniques. And this nobleman he was teaching was a slow student and got annoyed at him and felt he was holding back on him, not teaching him everything he knew. And so he reported him to the church authorities, who arrested him, and then he was extradited to Rome and was held prisoner for seven years with repeated interrogations and refused to cave on his viewpoints and uh, to viewpoints of people that probably he recognized as inferior to him and within terms of intelligence and understanding that were trying to force him to uh, affirm dogma that they had made as part of their authority and political power. So his last words, as he was on this, he was, as I read it, he was uh, 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 put naked on, a, on an iron post and burned to death. And his last words were to burn and not refute. To burn is not to refute. He was defiant to the end. So they now have a monument to Giordano Bruno in Rome at the site where he was burned to death. Victory. <laughs> this is my last statement. Bellator Luminous. Bellator Luminous. That means I'm asking you to be a warrior for light, enlightenment. Teachers are heroes, warriors raising others above ignorance and prejudice, saving the future for untold multitudes of people, one idea after another. Teachers pass the torch of civilization and understanding to all who listen and remember and wonder, to all who keep the flame and carry forward humankind. And all the time, teachers protect, nurture, and mentor the spirit of exploration and the intellect of seekers, and especially visionaries, who bring their gifts to the world, especially as they seek truth and savage honesty. Now, thinking of Amy Nurther, it's never too late to embrace a discipline whose ideas resonate spinning and humming in your mind. No one has authority to deny your role in the future of thought. This time is yours to discover your own paths to new possibilities and fulfill your own passions for ideas. You need only reach for understanding of questions that spring up from the deep well of your curiosity and you will become master of a kingdom of thought and imagination. And that is my talk. I'm going to send out the uh, note card for today once again, because I can't tell who already has it. So you might have a, a duplicate, uh, receive a duplicate here. Um, uh, It's free, so. <laughs> uh, any comments? I'm so glad my internet held up. It's been really flaky recently. I was an, I'm retired now. I was an otolaryngologist, uh, which is ears, nose, throat, head, and neck surgery. And I was drawn to that because I was a mathematician originally, and I uh, thought uh, there were all these 
periodic functions potentially explorable and uh, the physiology of hearing and neural processing of sound and speech and production of speech and song. All of that is um, uh, quite interesting and uh, potentially mathematical. Uh, Synergy, that's an interesting statement you did about NASA's uh, uh, studying uh, kids solving problems. Uh, I saw a uh, um, an interview of Carl Sagan talking about children and how when you talk to them and they're small, they'll ask all kinds of questions and they're good questions. They're questions about how does what's the go of this and why is this this way and how does this fit in? And when they go and talk to seniors in high school, they've got no questions anymore. Something's happened to them. They've been crushed. And yes, it was a condemnation of the education system. And I think that it's for us to try to protect this culture of science and mathematics and this manner of gathering understanding and information about the universe and making sense of it because it's under attack. <laughs>